Hello everyone, welcome. This next talk is titled, I'm sorry Dave, I can't do that. Ethics and software development and our speaker today is Dr. Morgan Lee. I have been advised with regards to questions, we will be accepting questions only, so if you have any comments or opinions or quips you'd like to make, please hold on to those and keep them with yourself. Um, I've been reminded we do have a, and I'd like to remind you all, we do have a code of contact, so please keep that in mind. However, I'm sorry Dave, I can't do that. Ethics and software development, Dr. Morgan Lee, can I get you all to please give her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Um, before I start, the reason he's mentioning there's a code of conduct is I have to disclaim that this may be a challenging talk for some people. I'm going to be critically examining the sacred cows of our society, religion and science and capitalism. So I really want you to try to have a sense of humour about the things that you hold dearest and leave your righteous indignation at the door. And then everything will be fine. <laughs> um, okay, so what are me? I am a pagan theologian, which is of course the natural person you want speaking at LinuxConf. <laughs> um, and I'm a virtual world developer. Here are some worlds that I built. Um, so I like to build worlds and think about how they work. I didn't build this one. So, for my PhD, I studied religion in virtual worlds. To try to answer the question, if you do a ritual in a virtual world, is it a real ritual? Um, of course, this led me down some very, very deep ontological rabbit holes. Why is this an important question, I hear you ask? I'm fairly sure that one or two of you will be gamers. So, when one is a gamer, one is often asked, why do you spend so much time gaming? Why don't you get out and do something in the real world? That's not real. In sociology, there's a theorem called Thomas's theorem, coined by Mr. and Mrs. Thomas, and it says, if men define situations as real, they are real in their consequences. And basically that means if you think it's real, it's real to you. People have been killed over gaming. People have neglected their children until they die because of gaming, and people have neglected themselves until they die because they would rather be gaming. This seems pretty real to me. Uh, this is my thesis, Virtually Real Being in Cyberspace, which you can download from the UTAS e-repository. So while people ask if gaming is real, they don't often inquire about the ontological status of programming. Obviously, code is real. We pay people money to do it, it must be real. Our society runs on it. It's not like people are programming for fun or anything. <laughs> that statement tells us a lot about our society's relationship to work, fun, and money, all of which are problematic. Coding is real because it's real in its consequences. People get killed by code all the time. Any day now, Hal will be refusing to open the pod bay door. Humans need gods. Every single human society that we know of has had gods. And there is a really good reason for that. Gods give us things to look up to. They are things we can aspire to. They keep us heading in the right direction, the direction of right, and serve as an exemplar. I know right now that a lot of you are thinking about your own experiences with religion and the dismal performance of many allegedly religious people that we are seeing in our society today. And you are right to deride the hypocrisy of those people who set themselves up as moral exemplars and yet betray the very principles they seek to promote. I was raised a Catholic. Catholicism is the proprietary version of religion. <laughs> One guy owns it. You can't access the source directly, you have to go through an intermediary, and if you contravene the terms and conditions, they will rain fire down on you, literally. Now I'm a pagan, which is open source religion. 
There are a million different distros. You can access the source directly. You can repackage other people's distros. You can incorporate source information from other distros and make your own one. It is antithetical to the concept of intellectual property. No one owns it and anyone can modify it. In my thesis, I focused on ancient Egyptian religion. And I'd like to introduce you to a key goddess from that culture. Her name is Mart. Mart is the goddess of truth and justice and order. She represents both the moral ideal and the code of conduct one should follow to attain the ideal. She represents the moral principles every Egyptian citizen was expected to follow throughout their daily lives. They are expected to act with honor and truth in all matters that involve the family, the community, the nation, the environment, and the gods. The entire focus of ancient Egyptian religion was the preservation of Mart. Because if you didn't uphold Mart, the serpent Apep would come along and it's all down the hill from there. This is a really important message. Ancient Egyptian society was one of the most stable, most successful, most long-lived cultures that we know of. If you want ethical things to be paramount, you have to put ethical things in a paramount position. It's not okay to say, oh, we'll deal with ethical implications later. Not happening. So, why is all this stuff going down in our society? The West used to be one united thing called Christendom, where everybody shared the same moral code. Everybody knew what was expected from everybody else. But we, that's all dying. We are in an axial age between the fall of Christendom and the rise of whatever moral framework is going to come next. But we don't know what that is. So consequently, we're living in a kind of confused moral vacuum where the limits of right and wrong are quite frankly described only by profit. The defining belief systems of our age are scientism and capitalism. But science isn't a belief system, I hear you say. Science is empirical. To you, I say, science is a belief system founded on the idea that the scientific method is the only way to attain knowledge. It is inherently quantitative, unlike humans. Science, however, is not the problem. Scientism is the problem. And scientism is the belief that science is the one true way. Most scientismists are not scientists. Scientists recognize the limitations of science, most of them. But scientismists don't understand science. They believe in science. The problem with this is that science is a mononosticism, which means it believes there's only one way to attain knowledge. Another problem with science is that it can't be applied to everything. Science can tell you how to do things, but not if you should do them. These two things are the cause of much cognitive dissonance among the overly rational. These people are often attracted to software development. From Protestantism, capitalism has taken the work ethic, but it has stripped away the moral aspects. So, as you can see from this graph, capitalism and the Industrial Revolution has made our lives materially heaps better, loads better. But we aren't happy. Uh, these two links that are on the page, from one of them comes this quote. Meanwhile, many wealthy countries are also suffering from growing rates of chronic disease like obesity and diabetes, along with mental health problems, stress, anxiety, depression, exacerbated by an intense work culture, along with the use of the very devices that have helped generate unprecedented profits for technology companies. Despite a 20-fold increase in material wealth over the past three centuries, people are not 20 times happier. In fact, we are struggling to get by. It's almost as if capitalism is a really bad idea. Here's a quote from the renowned philosopher Angel, the vampire. <laughs> Since its inception, software development has been all about what can be done and what can't be done. 
But it wasn't about morality, it was about practicalities. What will compile, what won't, what will work, what won't. In the 1990s, which was a heady time, a time when the internet was all about freedom, John Perry Barlow published the Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, in which he declaimed, Governments of the industrial world, you weary giants of flesh and steel, I come from cyberspace, the new home of mind on behalf of the future. I ask you to leave, I ask you of the past to leave us alone. You are not welcome among us. You have no sovereignty where we gather. It was all very stirring. I wanted to believe it. We all wanted to believe it. And at that time, it was kind of possible to believe such statements if you were really naive and had never studied history. <laughs> as early as 1999, Lawrence Lessig, a professor of law at Harvard, was bursting the bubble. In his Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, he argues that while cyberspace could be a place of freedom, it could just as well be a place of exquisitely excessive control. Barlow claimed, you have no moral right to rule us, nor do you possess any methods of enforcement we have true reason to fear. He was wrong about this. Julian Assange is a classic case of how he was wrong about that. I think he's really fearing methods of enforcement at the moment. Barlow said, you do not know our culture, our ethics, or the unwritten codes that already provide our society more order than could be obtained by any of your impositions. But he didn't explain the basis of his code of ethics or morality. He was also wrong about this because he said, our culture, his we is a singular we. He presumes one culture in cyberspace. And there's not just one culture in cyberspace, there's a million different ones. And finally, he said, we are creating a world where anyone may express his or her beliefs, no matter how singular, without fear of being coerced into silence or conformity. He was, sadly, right about this. Toxic diet discourse now fills all our feeds. Cyberspace was open, but open is not enough. Things can be open and still be bad. Open doesn't necessitate ethical use. If you decide to take an otherwise free and open source license and add a clause to it that says you cannot use this software to tor torture kittens, then it is no longer free and open source because it restricts certain uses. Wikipedia. I've been an editor of Wikipedia for 13 years. I've been a big supporter of the Wikipedia project. But Wikipedia, despite being one of the most open projects that there is, everything is open on Wikipedia. However, Wikipedia has been captured by radical pseudo-skeptics. A pseudo-skeptic is someone who pretends to be a skeptic, but actually is not a skeptic. They're just about information control. There's a huge push on Wikipedia to portray alternative medicine, among other things, as pseudoscience and at GMOs as above, uh, as above re reproach. Things such as, if you want a really good example, go look at the acupuncture article, which has been a flame war for the last four or five years. So it, this is pure hypocrisy because these people are literally arguing that an expert on any topic they decide is pseudoscience cannot be cited on Wikipedia. Doesn't matter if they're published in a peer-reviewed journal or an academic press or anything. It has been decided that certain topics are pseudoscience and therefore you cannot, you cannot cite those topics. Um, uh, Guerrilla Skeptics is a website where skeptics organize off Wikipedia in order to edit articles. This is totally and completely against Wikipedia's rules, but Wikipedia has done nothing about it. 11,000 people signed a petition to Jimmy Wales to say, please do something about this problem. And he came back with, you guys are all lunatic charlatans and we're doing nothing about this. Um, uh, so some of you may have heard of Rupert Sheldrake, who is a fabulously famous biologist and author of more than 85 scientific papers and eight books. He was among the top 100 global thought leaders for 2013. And on ResearchGate, his score of 33.5 puts him among the top 7.5 researchers. But on Wikipedia, 
His work is classified as pseudoscience and can't be cited. Here's an interesting thing. If the people on Wikipedia see this talk that I'm giving now, they will be using it to try to get me banned. I am serious. They will really be doing that. That's how far they are taking it. So open is not enough. Your project can be as open as anything and it can be hijacked by a group with an ideological agenda. You've got to move along to a more ethical framework. So what is ethics? In 1967, Arthur C. Clarke said this quote. He is proving to be more and more prescient every day. So ethics is the use of one's rational faculties to examine moral questions. And morality is to distinguish between what is right and proper and what is not. Rationality. Rationality is overrated. Rationality is easy. If one follows a set of steps, if the steps have consistently and if it's consistency and if they're followed correctly, it's easy to determine if a thing passes a rational quest test. If cats are black, the cat animals are cat. If cats are black and the cat's pink, the animal is a cat, obviously fails a rational test. But there are some questions that you cannot use rationality to judge. Should I love my cat? Programming deals with rational and irrational, but it can't say anything about a-rational. Coding is all about the mind. There's absolute truth and absolute fal falsehood. And it's really easy to get caught up in that and think about what you're doing and good ways to do things and not whether you should, them, should, should do them. You can do this when actually all you need is this. But... Where does morality come into FizzBuzz? Divergent and convergent. John Michael Greer, who some of you may know from such exciting series as Retrotopia and After Oil, uh, has a really good blog post about this on his site. So there are two classes of problems, convergent and divergent. Convergent problems have a single right answer. Divergent problems don't have a single right answer. Divergent problems are problems of value, while convergent problems are problems of facts. A convergent problem asks, what is the world? The divergent problem asks, what is the world? What should I do about the world? For that latter question, there's no one answer that applies to everyone. So it's become popular in recent years for rationalists to insist that convergent problems are the only ones that matter. This is nonsense. What you should do for a living is a divergent question. The, qu the answers differ from one person to another, but how you answer those questions has a far greater impact on your chances for a happy and productive life than any merely convergent question. So now we're gonna examine some ethical issues. Kittens, everybody loves kittens. Is it okay to poke a kitten with a needle? When we're talking about ethics, there's a couple of things that we usually mention, and one is consent, and the other is harm. So generally, I'm hoping we all will kind of agree that no, it's not okay to poke a kitten with a needle because A, the kitten can't consent, and B, the kitten is being harmed. Plus, it's mean. How can you do such a thing to a cute wee thing? What if I give you pizza if you poke kittens? No? What if you have a spouse and six starving children who really need that pizza to live? Then is it okay to poke the kitten with a needle to get the, to get the pizza to feed your six starving children and your spouse? I say no, because the kitten is still being harmed and the kitten still can't consent and it's still mean. But then you might ask, is the kitten more important than your spouse and six starving children? Probably you're gonna say no, but does that make it right? Okay, what if it's 
an ugly kitten? <laughs> is it okay to poke an ugly kitten? No, the kitten is still being harmed and the kitten can't consent. Is it okay to poke an evil kitten? No, the kitten is still being harmed and the kitten can't consent. Is it okay to poke a dead kitten with needles? The kitten is not being harmed and no consent can be obtained because it's dead. But it's creepy. <laughs> Rationality can't tell you anything about creepy. Would you tell your mum happily that you poke dead kittens with needles to get pizza? <laughs> I'm guessing not. It's not enough to do no harm. You have to provide a benefit. You have to be proud of what you do. What if the kitten, what if nobody knows that you're poking a kitten with a needle? What if the kitten's in a binary blob? Is it okay to poke a kitten with a needle if it's medicine? The kitten is being harmed by the prick, but it will benefit. But the kitten can't consent. We might argue that the kitten is not smart enough to consent. So we're smarter than kittens and we know it's going to benefit so we can consent for it. Users don't understand programming so we can consent for them. No? We want to consent for the kitten because of our own reasons. We love the kitten. We don't want it to die because we'll be sad. We reason we would want the treatment if we were the kitten. So we've made a choice for the kitten based on our own emotions plus a rationalism. So I'm going to say here, the golden rule, which is do unto others as you would have them do unto you, is not a good rule because you are making assumptions for other people. I'm going to suggest the rule of do unto others as they would have you do unto them because then you have to get an understanding of what they want first. You have to know what they want. You have to speak to them and find out what they want and ask more questions. Okay. Maybe you'll provide them with a dialogue box that asks them if they want all their data stored in the cloud. Um, okay, so moving right along. Now we're going to have a fabulous experience. I'm going to need some volunteers from the audience. I need like six people. Please let's do this quickly because we don't have a lot of time. Just come down the front. Come down the front, people. <laughs> yes, six people. Please, more people, come down the front. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Awesome, not quite yet. Okay, so guys, please all take one of these. And please all take one of these. So first of all, I'm going to say, do any of you people have any like massive food allergies? You know, <laughs> are you going to, you know, die? I'd also like to note at this point to other people that this is a self-selecting group. There's a whole lot of people who aren't even in this conversation because of reasons. So I'd like you to all take one of these. So the Internet of Things is about experiences. We're going to have an experience. Okay, so I'd like you to all eat lolly number two that you just took. Eat lolly number two. <laughs> okay, so while you're eating lolly number two, I'd like you to now organize yourself. Come over this side if you love lolly number two. Come over this side if you hate lolly number two, number two and just be <laughs> in the middle if you, you know, really ambivalent. By the way, the napkin is so you can spit out lolly number two if you hate it. <laughs> And lolly number one is to help you recover from lolly number two. <laughs> that side bad, this side good? Yeah, the, the, the lolly number two, the one you just ate, yeah. that's if you like it, and this is if you really don't like it. <laughs> okay. This is don't like, and this is like. Okay. <laughs> okay, I would be over here. I'm not even brave enough to eat those lollies, okay? I'm totally over here. So. Uh, who really loves the lollies? Like, really loves, okay. 
Come over here. I'd like you to convince this man that he should like your lolly. <laughs> um, it's, it's like beautiful and refreshing and bitter. Uh, like a... <laughs> like a bitter it was, yes. l- like, a, like a really young apple off the tree. Yeah. You know, not quite ripe yet. So full of goodness and vitamin C that you can't... <laughs> okay. You can't, and then it gets sweet and yummy. Funny you didn't mention it's overwhelmingly sour. I said bitter. Mm. So you, I'd like you to convince him that, you, that he's wrong and you're right. It's, it's um, nauseously... Um, <laughs> it's sick and makes you feel like you've been drinking vinegar or something. Mm. OK, thank you, gentlemen. So rationality can tell you nothing about the user's experience. <laughs> oh, oh, gentlemen, sorry, I've got... Um, I've got some lollies here for you, gentlemen. You might maybe want to get them on the way out. Please take a bag of lollies for participating in the experience. Okay, so you can't predict what the user's experience is. The user can't justify your, their experience to you, and neither should they have to justify their experience to you. So you have to give your user the benefit of the doubt. You have to provide them options. You don't just have to do what will make money what your venture capitalist wants you to do. So, could you, should you? We're building a dystopia just to make people click on ads. We're training people in very bad ways. Software development is an artifact of late stage capitalism. Originally, the culture of development was built on the precept that if it makes money, it's good. This creates problems. One is that if you wave large sums of money under people's noses, they don't behave at their best. Second is, if all your product has to do to be good is make money, it can do some hideously morally reprehensible things. So these days, most developers are not trying to get rich off a killer app. They're just trying to earn a salary and feed their spouse and 600 children. So if you're dependent on a salary to pay your mortgage, and especially if you're a poor American and you're dependent on your employer for your health care and your children's health care, you're probably super unlikely to quit because your boss wants you to do dodgy things. Even less if you're not aware of what the boss's overall plan is. In his awesome novel, Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson describes how YT's mum works for the American government as a programmer. But the government's so paranoid about what they're doing, because they're doing dodgy things, that they don't even let their programmers know what they're doing. Each programmer gets a tiny little piece of a task to do, So I'm going to tell you a story about a guy who got a job, and his job was to build a tool to use phones to find Wi-Fi signals. So he thought, wow, this is a really interesting question. How can I do this? The tool would look at the Wi-Fi signal and see how the strength changed as your phone moved around. If the signal got stronger, you were getting closer. If it got weaker, you were moving away. Next feature was to add a, a tracking to track a moving Wi-Fi access point. He kind of went, I wonder why an access point would be moving, but that's not interesting. Let's figure out how to fix the problem. So once they'd nailed that problem, uh, they were asked, how about if it could sniff sniff for the signals put out by phones as well as Wi-Fi hotspots? So this was a much harder problem from a technical perspective, but it was really interesting. So off he went and worked out how to do it. So it turns out that the project was never about tracking Wi-Fi. It was about tracking phones, phones carried by people, so you can shoot them. How to kill people with software. So people often say, oh, this is all new. Software is all new. And these ethical conundrums that we're experiencing now are all really new problems. And it's no wonder that we're getting it wrong because we hadn't thought about it before. Now we're going to look at some of those things that are really different and unusual about ethics in software development. (laughs) Software can keep kill people now, but it's not a brand new problem. It's been around for a while. It's been around since at least 1931. It's always good to have Nazis in your talk. 
Um, this is what happens when a toxic ideology is your highest purpose. This is a tabulating machine that was used by the Nazis in order to find all the Jews very efficiently and send them to the gas chamber. They were super upfront about what they wanted to do. They published in international st statistical journals about what they wanted to do, exactly what they wanted to do. And IBM decided to help them because it was super profitable for IBM. How to kill people with software? Not on purpose. The Therac radiation machine, 1983 was a radiation machine for people with cancer. Unfortunately, the software was written by a programmer with little experience coding for real-time systems. There were no comments and no proof that any analysis had been performed. What more, they reused code from earlier machines and presumed, because it's been used before and been used in the field in these highly successful machines, it will be totally cool. It was not totally cool. But how bad, there's two examples from the whole of history, how bad can this be, you're thinking. So I went to do some research for this talk about bad things that had happened. I soon found I had 31 pages of research notes about bad things that had happened, so I thought I'll narrow it down to one year. I had so much stuff that I thought I'd make a word cloud instead of 31 pages of research notes. Here's the word cloud. So as you can see, Facebook shines out there more than anything after software. This list is a list of just bad things that happened last year with Facebook. In one year that many things happened on Facebook. Should I work for Facebook is a divergent question. And it's one that I would encourage you to think about. So let's look at another, we'll look at one case in detail. I love VW, this is my VW, I love it. I've always loved VW, I did my motor mechanics apprenticeship on VWs, I like VWs. Suffice it to say, I was super disappointed with VW recently. So most of you might know, but I'll give you the Reader's Digest condensed version. VW had to meet US emission limits. They soon discovered they could not meet US emission limits. So they did what every good software engineer does and they made a hack to solve the problem where they had test mode and road mode. And when the car was in test mode, it would be tested and it would pass. And when it was in road mode, it would admit 40 times more emissions than it was allowed to. So surprise, surprise, people found out. So, this case highlights the failures of a compliance mindset. There are rules, you've got to meet the rules if you can't read the rules. Writing a hack to make things work because you can't do them within the rules is what software engineers do all the time, all the time. So it seems like a normal thing to do, but this had consequences. A quote from, from one of the stories. He knew that what he was doing was wrong, but he minimized his own moral responsibility for the fraud by reassuring himself that he was just an engineer doing his job, and his job was to present practical solutions to problems regardless of their proprietary, propriety. Which is, takes us back to the Nazis again, uh, because in the Nuremberg trials after the Second World War, principle four was the fact that a person acted pursuant to an order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law, provided a moral choice was in fact possible to him. People will say he had no choice, he would lose his job. That is a choice. You always have a choice. You might not like your choice, but you always have one. This kind of problem cannot be the problem of a few rogue engineers. It went all the way up the ladder. The engineer was sentenced to three years in prison and ordered to pay $200,000. VW is set to pay $4.3 billion in criminal and civil uh, penalties. 
and uh, uh, an executive for once was actually jailed. Um, and um, the comment of the judge was, you viewed this cover up as an opportunity to sign, to climb the corporate ladder. Your goal was to impress senior management. I reckon they all know about him now. So this is really important to us as Australians because we now have the wonderful AA Act where our glorious leaders can come to us and say, backdoor that software and don't tell anyone. You might be interested to know that some of the best paid people in the world are software engineers and software engineer managers, which means you are in a fabulous position to actually take a moral stand and say, no, I am not going to write that back door. I am not going to keep my company in Australia where I am subject to those provisions. If people like you, who are really well off and can easily get another job, how many software developer positions are there vacant? There's a billion of them. If you guys can't act morally, how can anyone else? There are things that are happening that can be done, and some software developers have formed a union. But we are in this axial age, and in the coming time, I put it to you that cha major changes in our society will not be because governments do things, because look at them. <coughs> They will be brought about by the actions of individual people, maybe a whole lot of individual people who get together and do something, but individual people. Epictetus was a Greek philosopher of the first century BCE, and he was a very smart guy. He was a slave, and he was a philosopher, but he basically said, change the stuff you can change. Sweat the things that you know you can change and don't worry about the other things. Can I change that Facebook has got 20 scandals in a year? Yes, if you work at Facebook, you can. Can I change the fact that an orange-headed maniac is in the White House? <laughs> you can't change that. Unless you're an American, you can try and change that, but here, we can't change that. So work on the things you can change but you need to know what your own morality is. Nobody's morality is going to be the same, and I'm not here to tell you what your morality should be, but know what it is, because then you will recognize things. You will, when you are given an interesting challenge to work out about how to track Wi-Fi, you might go, why is a Wi-Fi access point moving? Oh, it's a person. Maybe you want to kill the person. Think about what you're doing. Know what your morality is. Be aware of the problem. But also be aware that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Some guys at Lerner tried to do this thing where they said, we're not going to let people with ICE, at ICE, you, the American Immigration Service, use our software. But once they did this, they discovered two things. One, it's unenforceable. And two, it's no longer free and open source software once you do that. Codes of conduct, super popular. Codes of conduct, they are not the answer, but they are a good place to start. Here are a whole bunch of different codes of conduct that people have thought about, things, they, ways they might approach, look at them, look at them later. Um, creating codes of conduct is useful because it starts a conversation where you think about these things, but people do not do things because there is a code of conduct that says they should. You can't just give your new hire a code of conduct and say, do this thing, and expect they will do it. You need to make sure that the people you hire share your moral code, whatever that code is. So the, th the things you need in order to be an ethical software, to follow these five easy tips to perfect ethical software development. <laughs> They're easy, super easy. Integrity, courage. That's what you need. Neutrality helps the oppressor. If you do nothing, bad shit happens. So develop your courage, develop your integrity, 
Recognize your power. You guys have the power. People need you. People are desperate for really good software developers. They need you. You have the power. Take that power and use it in an ethical way, whatever your moral code says. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Talk, really appreciate that. Um, some some food for thought. One of the uh, things that I, I, I hope you could comment on, but um, we, we we go back to capitalism. Uh, now, capitalism, as we know, still requires a, a governing authority to actually drive something. So there still has to be property ownership, etc. But it struck me, or has struck me for a while, that the open source community is actually the epitome of a capitalist free market. You know, if, if, if stuff is useful, it gets used. If it doesn't get useful, um, it doesn't get used. So, uh, have you got any comments on that? What exactly is your question? <laughs> Do I think that free and open software is a capitalist system? Is that your question? No, because the, 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 ethos, the ethos of free and open software doesn't actually include, doesn't actually include capital. It's all about the ideals. Yes, sorry. That's, it's, uh, forget the money side of capitalism. You can't forget the money side of capitalism <laughs> because it's <laughs> capitalism. I want to just put out that, uh, putting a statement out there and then asking do you agree is probably not a question. Not a question. The lady here has a question. Yes. Oh, here, down the front. Hi, I first of all wanted to say I was sorry for singing out before I That's just right. got a bit it's enthusiastic. Fine. It's fine. Um, you use the term ethics and morals and mm -hmm. you use them, you sort of go between the two. I know how I would differentiate between them, but can you specify what you are thinking when you use those okay. two different so, words? Uh, eth ethics is, uh, is using your rational faculties in order to arrive at moral ideals, and morality is the content of those moral ideals that you arrive at. Thank you. So that's about the same, but I just wanted to check. Yes. Um. Yay, Paul. <laughs> That was a really great talk, and I'm really glad that we're um, we're seeing more discussion of um, you know not just the sort of the principle of being open, but what it, you know what it's doing is it is it making the world a better place? Are we asking the right philosophical questions, or are we kind of getting bogged down in like you know? iterations of the trolley problem and how many kittens would you have to poke in order to get a pizza? How can we ask the right, those larger moral questions? Basically, any question you ask is the right question. Because if you ask a question, you're thinking about the problem. And to be frank, most of software development land is not thinking about the problem. They're thinking about how to look like they're thinking about the problem. <laughs> They're writing codes of conduct like mad. How do you, how do you, you know, look like it? So any question you ask is a good question. There are, in divergent questions, there are no absolutes. In the human condition, objectivity is impossible because objectivity requires complete knowledge and we are not omniscient. Only gods get to be objective, okay? So if I ask any question, any exploration is a good exploration. It's about your motivation and what you do with the question, with the answers that you get. Does it does that answer your question? Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Thank you. Um, I know that you're speaking generally about 
ethics and software development and the way those things intersect. I wondered what your personal opinion was about how passive resistance would work in terms of your ethical response to something. Do you think that passive resistance is a useful thing to do? For example, if you're working for Facebook, they pay extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, if you are not in a position to quit that job because of extenuating circumstances where that's not really a privilege that you have in a realistic world. Do you think that passive resistance, such as the way that they used to say, you know, if you want to resist the Nazis, take huh? a bag of moths to a cinema and release it so that they cover the screen, uh, cover the camera and you can't see what's on the screen. Uh -huh. Do you think that that would work personally for you? First two things. One, it is my personal opinion that no one who works for Facebook is in a position where they can't quit because of the high rate of vacancies for software developers. Uh, I recognize for Americans it's difficult to quit because when they quit and start a new job, often their health care is in abeyance for some time. So that is difficult, but it's always possible. It's about this thing, courage. Uh, the other part of your question is, yes, passive resistance works, but do you want to be fighting an important battle all the time? Or do you want to go somewhere else where you don't have to fight that battle and you can, po you can contribute in a more positive, active way to a project which is really doing good? So you're not just like in a holding pattern, you're not just trying to, rather than trying to stop evil, try to advance good. Because A, you'll be more happy, um, and B, I think it will be more effective. Hmm. Unfortunately, we've run out of time there. So Catch me later if you have another question. Please, can we have another round of applause for Dr. Yeah. Morgan Lee? <laughs>